Um, it's kind of tough to talk about flows of energy post lunch, but uh, I'll do my best, especially the energy I'm talking about. Uh, this is a story about resistance. It is a story about co-optation of resistance. It is a story of corporate counter resistance. But ultimately, it's a story about violence, about state violence, market violence, and the violence that communities are forced to use to defend themselves and their way of life. Uh, this is about a particular conflict going on in India, and it's a part of a larger project uh, where I'm beginning to gather some empirical data on some theoretical work I had done on a concept of translocal resistance. So I'm studying resistance movements uh, from indigenous populations against essentially the extractive industries in 25 different countries, and this is one of the first ones. Uh, this is from India. Uh, India, in its emergence uh, to a superpower, uh, things we don't see on TV. There's, the best way to describe it, there's a civil war going on in India between the Aboriginal population and the state and the market. Uh, that doesn't get reported much. It's a, like most wars, it's a very violent war. And this is one example of a, a conflict which has just ended, hopefully, uh, last year. This involves, uh, interestingly enough, an Indian multinational company, so it's not an evil American or Brit multinational company. It's an Indian multinational company called Vedanta Mining which was listed in the London FTS exchange, uh, who were building a bauxite mine in the hills of Orissa to feed uh, their refinery at the plains. Uh, it is a, it's a beautiful spot. Uh, so this is a, a, what I'm describing to you is called rapid ethnography. It's a two-year ethnographic study on this. Uh, they faced opposition from the beginning, 10, 12 years ago, from a, a tribal group, an indigenous group, which lives on, on, on the mountains. And then from a local opposition, this became, as things do in India, a full-blown anti-mining, anti-state movement. It got international attention. I think Prince Charles got involved, the, the whole bunch of big NGOs uh, which got involved in the story. Um, and essentially, what we describe in, this, in the story is how, these, how this conflict was managed, what is the role of the corporations. And strangely enough, perhaps uh, counterintuitively, some of the more evil side of the NGOs, especially the Western NGOs, uh, in dealing or, or manipulating tribal conflicts uh, all over the world. Uh, what was the source of this conflict? I think the best way to look at it is to talk to or get the voices from the people themselves. This is from the mission statement of Vedanta, which is, I think, a $16 billion company. It's a big company. This is the channel. It talks about we believe our strategy and business objectives will harness India's high quality wealth of mineral resources at low cost of development, positioning it as a leader on the global metal and mining market. This is the statement from, uh, at that point of time, the tribal leader, the thorn in the flesh. He became the poster boy of the resistance movement. He was the only person who could speak English uh, in, that whole, in that whole region uh, because he uh, was educated in a missionary school. Uh, Niamgir is the name of the mountain. So without Niamgir, we cannot think of life. If we lose the mountain, we'll end up in great trouble. We will lose our soul. And uh, if Niamgir goes, our soul will die. Now, I don't know about you guys. I come from a business school. Um, soul is not a particularly efficient use of a mountain. <laughs> so having if people are wondering what I'm doing in a business school, studying anti corporate resistance, I can, all I can say is, I've made a fairly decent living biting the hand that feeds me. That's a great feeling. Now, the interesting part about it, it they're both right. Uh, Vedanta is absolutely right. India is a poor country, and you need resources to develop to get out of poverty. There's nothing, nobody's going to argue with that first statement. Curiously enough, nobody's going to argue with the second statement either. What happens when both are right, and as a wise man taught us 200 years ago, between two rights, force decides. And that's precisely what's happening in this conflict, where essentially state violence and state force is used to essentially prove one of these people righter than the other. Because essentially, contrary to the premise of the global economic paradigm, it is just not possible to have one universal metric for comparing and exchanging the real values of nature amongst different groups of people from different cultures, and most importantly, with vastly differing degrees of political and economic power. So obviously, the, the, the metric of the mountain as a bauxite source and the metric of mountain as a soul simply cannot be exchanged or, 
or compare. These are essentially incommensurable paradigm. Only one can exist. And that's what's pretty much is happening as we look at the conflict. So the, uh, I'm just going to give you a, an overview of the paper. It's a 18,000 word paper, and I still have not come to the discussion section. Uh, we, t we narrate the story of one person, this, this guy called Jika. Uh, he emerged in 2006, as I said, as the poster boy of the movement. And this is what he said. Uh, he was all, if you do a YouTube search of him, you get like half a million hits, which is remarkable considering that place doesn't have electricity. Uh, time has come to fight. There's no time to waste. Even if we die, we will not let me out we go. These are powerful words. Um, and this was said on television, in the BBC, wide media coverage. Two years later, he had this to say. I realized that the mining project will not have a detrimental effect on our livelihood and uh, will usher in development in, in our era. So I guess my question is, the starting point is, how, how do we theorize this? Okay. What can they tell us about the dynamics of these transnational social movements, about the role of corporations and the role of uh, civil society actors, to, to use a bad word? Okay. So if you look at some of the, uh, the, the timeline, initially it started off with a very local, uh, disorganized, unstructured, spontaneous uh, movement with some villagers that got together and said, no, we're going to stop. Then as the inevitability of the mine approached, as the big bulldozers started coming in, roads were being built, the campaign got a little bit more local and state uh, uh, attention. So local NGOs moved in. Then around 2006 to 2008, it got the attention of, I mean, not got the, the attention was brought to them of Action Aid and Survival International, these two very, very powerful NGOs. And then they got involved in this. And then, of course, it became a whole Western celebrity issue. Tribals are fairly popular in the West for some reason, provided they look right. Yeah. And then, of course, it ended up in conflict and then a relocalization of, of the struggle in many ways. Uh, I won't bore you with the theory, but this is broadly the theoretical framework of social movements. Most of the literature talks, these are called TANS, Transnational Advocacy Networks. Most of the literature focuses on the right-hand side. Essentially, groups in one country will appeal to citizens of another country through their transnational networks to put pressure on their own government to change a particular practice. So this is what is called a boomerang model. So if you look at the sweatshops, for example, you have the local NGOs go to Amnesty International, go to the Western NGOs, who put pressure on the US government, who then put pressure on, on Bangladesh, on, on, on Cambodia, to start cleaning up the rack. So that's the traditional model of social movements. What that ignores, of course, is what I have in the box this complete mess of the local activism. So it kind of privileges the Western NGOs, it privileges the transnational actor network without looking to account the local resistance, uh, which is completely disorganized sometimes, uh, doesn't even involve NGOs. A lot of the people we spoke to had left NGOs because they were very disillusioned by what the NGOs were doing and essentially became individual activists. Uh, and what they, I guess what they what, what to try to do in the paper, in the, in the story, is to look at how these NGOs interact with each other. That's the, pretty much the, the basic framework. Now, as I said, uh, one of the, the counterintuitive things we, we found was how suspicious the tribals were of NGOs, for good reason, as we will find out. Uh, this is a, a local uh, um, activist, individual activist, not an NGO, who said, as far as we are, we are concerned, they are very controversial. So if you just want to give information, support, that's fine. But if you start playing the role of leading the movement, then we have to suspect them. Uh, Action Aid, for example, was criticized on having a, a parallel leadership, uh, ignoring what is happening on the ground. Uh, there was a particular incident where a local, this person's brother actually, went to London for the annual general meeting of Vedanta to protest. He was dressed in Indian clothes and he, had, he was talking in Odia, he was shouting at a particular uh, you know, event. Action Aid had organized their own protest event, but because he was making so much noise, Action Aid asked him to shut up because they were interviewing Bianca Jago on TV about the same mine. But that voice was more important than the guy who was actually living on the mountain and had come here to protest there. So again, the tensions between the local and, and the Western NGO. This is a, another case where this is Jika himself. Uh, he was supposed to take uh, a, group, a group of uh, uh, 
activists around the mountain. Because don't forget, he's the only guy who can speak English. Most of the activists, including the Indian ones, couldn't speak the local language. Um, and he was supposed to meet them, and he didn't show up. They found out that ActionAid had hired a documentary filmmaker and had paid Jika more money to, to get them instead. And they'd given him a cell phone. Yeah. So this is the local guy saying, this is what happened. How did, sorry, this was Survival International, not ActionAid. How come Survival just gives out his phone number? We've got to get him a new number as soon as possible. So here he was, this man, locally, you know, kind of caught between this. So finally, the local NGOs caught him. They took away his cell phone, given by Survival International, gave them their own cell phone, and said, you will not take calls from these foreigners there, who are basically fighting the same battle. Okay, so what's interesting is they use the term, this is another extractive industry happening. That again, you're extracting the, the, the tribal resistance for, I guess, your own purposes. Now, the corporation is very much at the center of this, and they certainly did not sit quiet. Um, there are a list of measures we found what they were using. Uh, AstroTurf organizing is something we use in our field. It's basically fake grassroots organizing. So they started their own rallies. <laughs> so they started their own uh, movements you know, with people pro-mining, tribal people saying, oh, tri mining is good for us. Um, what's interesting is then, of course, the use of CSR as a weapon to neutralize resistance. Uh, in a more ludicrous example, uh, Vedanta had financed a local village cricket club and given them brand new cricket bats. To, you know, and then at a particular protest, this particular villagers turned on the protesters, tribal, using the cricket bats to beat them. So using the, this is the CSR sponsored cricket bat by the company. So there's a variety of strategies used, not just to neutralize, but to counter resistance. Again, this has not been well theorized in the literature these counter-mobilization act, uh, activities. So essentially the corporation was playing a very political role, uh, including making donations to the political party in power. Uh, violence, uh, beating up about 12 people were killed by the police, um, targeting and co-opting individual activists, essentially trying to buy people off. Um, this was essentially some of the strategies used by these companies. And it seemed to have worked, at least it seemed to have worked in 2009, led to what is called the major defection of this poster boy hero of the tribal movement. Uh, this is what he had to say, that uh, we were actually misguided by the NGOs. Uh, they are not working for our people's interest, they are working for them. There's an element of truth to this. Essentially, what he's trying to say is, these Western NGOs make money out of our poverty. It helps them that we stay poor because that's how they can get more funding to help us so-called help us. That's the basic philosophy of this. So there's, there's, there's a certain amount, amount of truth to this statement. So next time if they come, we will send them out. And this is, I guess, shows again the power of an individual activist there. At a certain point of time, the tribals got really sick of the NGO uh, involvement in the territory, and they basically got together and said, next time anybody comes here, we're going to beat you up. So they said, we want an NGO-free area which ironically, of course, served the government's interest because the Vedanta kept telling the government there are these foreign NGOs who are making trouble. They want India to be poor. These are all this colonial stuff in there. So it served the, the government and the company real, real fine when the tribals decided that, that they're going to take matters into their own hand and get out of the NGO mess. Another statement he gave just uh, before he was uh, evicted from the movement about development, they need development like other people. And again, we want the mine. So it's very, very positive. So Vedanta has come. Uh, and this is the interesting part. And we can call him all sorts of things that, oh, he, you know, he sold out. But there's a certain amount of agency here. Yeah. Where is this guy now? He's doing an MBA paid for by Vedanta in the city. He has a house and a motorcycle. And he says, my people are illiterate, undeveloped, and, and, and not educated. I'm going to do my MBA. I'm going to come back there, and I'm going to develop my people. Of course, the tribal people don't want the mine. But the cost of that was essentially saying, yes, I'm with the mining company in this. So at one level, at an individual level, you can actually say he was pretty smart. He played the company to get what he wanted there. Uh, and he was one of the few people in the tribal areas who did have connections with the city, because he was brought up by a, a missionary. So, this, as I said, the issues, I guess, are not as, as straightforward as we like. And from our empirical data, we're trying to, we're trying to come up with, a, 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 I guess, a fairly positivistic, measurable model 
looking at this kind of resistance. And we look, we're finding three themes. There is the internationalization theme, which happened here, where the Western NGOs come in. This is your classic transnational advocacy network. There's also localization, localization theme. That has not been studied very well. And what's most important, right in the center, there is very active corporate counter-organizing uh, through these uh, defections, through lobbying, uh, through CSR. Means. This essentially would, is a much more broader framework, we feel a much more richer framework to understand uh, resistance movements across the world. And just in closing, um, some of the countries I guess we are looking at, uh, it's uh, not surprising. Um, I have a list of 25 countries which is going to be in my sample. I only stopped at 25 because they fit on one A4 piece of paper, which makes editors very happy. Uh, the countries, not surprising. Sub-Saharan Africa, Botswana, uh, Peru, Brazil, India, Malaysia, China. It is no coincidence that all these countries are former colonies. It is also no coincidence that the multinational companies involved in this are headquartered in London, Paris, Berlin, New York, in many ways. So it is a different form of, I guess, uh, uh, neocolonialism happening in the extractive industry. And just out of, out of curiosity, just out, this is, all this stuff right now is public knowledge, so I'm not betraying any confidences. This is stuff from the interviews on radio, on, on TV, or what's available on the net. I picked out to see how remarkably similar across five continents these conflicts are. These are statements from the tribal people themselves. These are not NGO statements. These are indigenous people fighting against the mining companies and their state. The italics are mine. United, fight their land, fight, behead, fight, die. Women, court case, traditional elder, beliefs, fight, and die again. Now from memory, India, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Malaysia. Completely different reasons, completely different histories again. And that's, I guess, one of our concepts in this paper is to look at what we, we're defining this as translocal resistance. So these are not local, not international, not transnational. These are small translocal spaces occurring in these different sites at, uh, at, uh, different, at, at sometimes the same time, but also different times. Right? Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you for your time and attention. I'll be happy to have you take any questions.